afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Macquarie Australia Conference. The last presentation for this session is from Chris Allison, the, the Managing Director of Mineral Resources. Chris is coming to us virtually from his Perth office. Uh, Chris, I'll hand over to you for the presentation, then we'll, we'll come back to, to here live for some Q&A. OK, well done. Yep, thank you. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining into uh, my presentation. Um, I'm Chris Allison. I'm the Managing Director of Mineral Resources, and I'm just going to run you through um, the MinRes business, where it's at today, where it's come from, and uh, where I'm taking it over the next five or so years. Uh, the business was founded about 30 years ago this July. Uh, I had $10,000 in cash in the bank when we first started. Um, we did that about 92. We listed the business in 2006 for about 100 mil market cap. Uh, we were employing about 450 people in those days. Um, today, we're about 11 billion market cap and we've got over 5,000 people on the payroll. The business has basically been developed and grown um, focus on, on originally on mining services and uh, later getting into uh, commodities. We've always sort of tried to focus in areas where we've got a reasonable return and um, we get a decent um, payment for our services. Um, we've got a very strong contracting culture in the business. That's sort of the core of um, who we are. And we've used that to be able to get that into the mining industry and make sure that we've got um, significant um, work ethic and, and that develops our, um, um, our high, um, high returns in terms of, um, sorry, I lost my way on that. Since we listed the business, um, we've averaged return on capital of around 23%. Um, total EBITDA, um, the business has earned since it went public, um, 6.6 .6 billion. And uh, dividends, we've paid about 1.6 billion. Compound annual growth is around 32% return to our shareholders. And we're probably sitting about number three on the ASX 200 in, uh, in that category. Same business model has been around for 30 years. It still exists today. Um, we've got tier one clients. We've got some very good tier one assets now in our commodity business. Uh, we've got a very tough balance sheet uh, and we've got some world-class projects sitting in front of us. So um, we're going to be pretty busy the rest of this year. In fact, for the next three to four years out, we get some high quality projects that we're going to be developing. Social responsibility, um, really important. We all have become much more aware of that over the last couple of years since COVID and a range of different issues out there on the planet, trying to make sure that we minimise carbon going into the atmosphere. Safety um, has always been a huge priority in our business. We sit in the top five um, of the best in the um, Australian mining industry. Last year, no lost time injuries um, and extremely low TRIFA rate uh, and a very strong focus nowadays on mental health in the business. We employ an in-house psychologist and we have a whole range of programs for training around um, health, mental health, um, educating our people and making sure that they understand that um, it's okay for them to put up their hand if they've got issues. The environment, we're committed to net zero as the whole mining industry is in the past two years. Our business has grown a lot, but over that period of time, we've actually reduced our emissions intensity by about 25%. Um, we are committed to zero emissions. We hope that we can get that done way before 2050. Our immediate focus is basically um, using solar and gas um, wherever we can to try and reduce our, um, our use of any coal-fired power that we're connected to through the grid or alternatively trying to get out of diesel as quick as we can. Um, the community, very, very strong focus. We provide a lot of support out in regional Australia and to the community, um, the landowners and the traditional uh, people in the, uh, the regions that we work in. We've got substantial uh, annual community sponsorships and donations that are going out right across the um, a different range of, uh, of um, needy recipients. And we spend about 1.3 billion um, on local business procurement um, over the last 12 months. And people, as I said, we've got over 5,000 in our business. We're recruiting second generation people. We're bringing in um, sons, daughters, um, relations of uh, MinRes employees. And we get them in here because they're generally a lot. They understand the culture and the, uh, the work ethic the, the, uh, the place has. 
We've got very good programs in place for uh, diversity, and we've been bringing an awful lot of um, uh, females into the business over the last couple of years and been very successful in being able to bring them in in a whole range of areas, and, and not just through uni, uni graduates, but um, traineeships and programs that we've got. Um, we've got probably about 150 um, graduates, trainees and, and apprentices um, in the business at the moment. And we're probably going to grow the apprentices around about by 20 each year. And we're going to add about 35 uni graduates to the business on an annual basis. Um, the business is made up of four core pillars, mining services, as I've said, lithium um, with a number five uh, producer, uh, in the world, we've got two extremely great tier one assets in um, our mines. Iron ore, we're number five um, in Australia as a producer, currently transitioning that business from a fairly high cost operation with small pits into long life, uh, low cost. And energy, we're trans transitioning into um, lower cost, greener energy sources inside the business. We've also um, got substantial land holding in both the Perth Basin and the Carnarvon Basin and we've had a very significant gas discovery up there um, late last year. A bit more detail around the mining services, um, foundation of the business, high quality tier one customers, and we're generally working on tier one deposits and generally around the iron ore business and the um, um, and gold. We've got long standing relationships with our clients. We've got 20 years plus um, we've got very long mining services contracts with our joint venture partners. So they're ranging from 20 to 40 years. The core of the, the, the uh, mining services business, of course, is the crushing and the processing. We've been doing that for a long, long time. We're the largest in the world as a build, own, operate crushing contractor. We've got four strategic port allocations spread around Western Australia. Um, very necessary to get um, commodities out. And we build mines and associated supply chains. We can build them on budget. We build them on time. We've got full in-house engineering design test facilities. We uh, employ um, a about 150 METs, geos, engineers um, that put all these packages together for us. And we've got a full in-house construction team we've been running for over 20 years. We've got over 600 permanent um, construction people in the business. And... They know how to build projects. They know how to get it done on time. Um, because we've had that core crew a long, long time, they understand the culture and um, they've got an extremely good track record in uh, getting our plants put together. So in the mining services business, it delivers very strong margin, um, reliable annuity earnings um, over a long period of time. Um, those earnings are generally, they're not affected by um, cycles. They're not affected by the um, commodity prices and we don't take any uh, any risk um, in that area since um, 2019 we've been able to have an annual increase of about 35 percent each year on the tons that we process uh, and our margins have increased by about 11 percent over that same time very dedicated experienced long-term management team um, running that part of the business we're uh, leading in our productivity, we sit generally 30 to 38% above um, our clients and the productivity and the tons that we move on a monthly basis. Um, in the last 12 months as part of the business earned just over 500 million in EBITDA. We've got a strong pipeline of uh, growth projects locked in ahead of us. So this part of the business is going to grow between 15 and 20% um, year on year for at least the next five years out and the mining services business is going to double over the next three to, to four years. Lithium business, um, the, probably the most important commodity um, in decarbonising the world. There's no alternative commodity to lithium. It can't be replaced. There's no substitute. It's got extremely strong demand, um, supplies and deficit, and uh, adding up the uh, cars that are going to get built over the next five to seven years versus the supply, the known supply coming into the market, it looks like there's going to be a supply deficit for um, some time. I did read this morning, someone said that um, the price of lithium is going to fall later this year. So good luck with that prediction. Um, prices are up over 10 times over the last 18 months. Uh, and the 
increase in price. So the price of um, hydroxide's gone from around 10, 11,000 a tonne. And, and on the spot market, it's sitting up about 81,000. It doesn't seem to have hurt the, um, the industry. Um, batteries have gone up about 30% in that time. Cost of a Tesla has gone up about 10%. And, and they are incidentally probably the most profitable car manufacturer in the world. There's five hard rock mines operating today in uh, Western Australia. One's got a fairly short life and, and there's another one due to come on stream in the next couple of years. There's not a lot more production coming on behind that. We own Wadjana and Mount Marion, of course, and we've got two great joint venture partners. We've got uh, Albemarle uh, joint venture with us both in Wadjana and the uh, hydroxide plant we're building down at Kimmerton and Gangfang for our joint venture partner down at Mount Marion, both. Um, exceptional partners and very uh, um, well adverse to building and operating hydroxide plants. We've got a clear roadmap ahead of us and where we're heading in terms of hydroxide. So we're eventually going to convert all of our spot that we produce into uh, hydroxide. That's about a four year journey. Um, and in the meantime, between now and then, we're going to be selling um, any surplus spot that we've got into the, um, into the spot market. Mount Marion. As I said, it's a tier one asset, 50-50 JV with Gangfang. The plant down there was designed and built and we run that as a mining services operation on behalf of the joint venture. Um, it was originally designed to produce about 200,000 tonne of 6% spod. We've changed that over recent times. Uh, we've been running for over a year um, at 450,000 tonne rate. That's mixed grade, so not all um, 6%. And we're just currently increasing that up to about 600,000 tonne run rate. Second stage of that development down there is going to be complete by December. So that'll give us a 900,000 tonne run rate coming out of Mount Marion. Again, it's mixed grade. So if you um, want to calculate that back to a 6%, it's about 620,000 tonnes equivalent coming out. And we took back our, uh, our offtake agreement. So and Res is now um, taking its own uh, spot from Mount Marion. Um, we're sending it up to China and we've got a toll treating agreement up there with Gangfang. So um, it's a short term contract to the end of uh, August. So we're just reorganizing um, all of our lithium business. So um, that'll change again by the time we get back into um, September this year. Wajina, um, it's one of the largest hard rock deposits in the world, very low strip ratio. The ore body's only drilled down to 500 metres and we know it continues beyond 650 metres. We know the grade gets better and we know that it's open on three different directions. So we've got all the infrastructure in place up there to build a fourth train. So we've got three up there right now um, for about 140 million in a 12 month build, we can have the fourth train up and running. The place was placed in care and maintenance back in 2019. Um, we've just turned it on recently. First train's gonna um, start production this month. So we'll have product uh, in the next few days coming out of that. Train two starting in July. Train three, probably around about December, but we'll be having a look and seeing what the um, demand looks like out in the, um, out in the wider world. And um, as I said, but um, the fourth train I expect will be starting construction on that later this year. So this slide just gives you a little bit of a roadmap on how we're going to uh, get to uh, a, a hydroxide producer. So we're currently producing, in fact, if you go back a year ago, the MinRes business was um, producing about 200,000 tonnes equivalent of SPOD. Um, and a year down the track from now, we're probably going to be producing about 1.4 million um, tons, so our share of that about 700,000. And then if you have a look down here at the hydroxide, at the lithium, uh, the, the hydroxide plant down at Kemerton um, is commissioning train one now, train two later this year. Um, that'll eventually, once we get those wound up, there's 40,000 tons, so 50,000 ton plant and 20,000 coming out for MinRes. Our share of uh, Wadjana should produce about 53,000 ton of hydroxide and Mount Marion, it'll be about 42,000. So about four years from now, we expect to be well north of um, 100,000 tonnes of hydroxide going into the market. 
iron ore, as I said, we're the fifth largest. We've been exporting iron ore for over 10 years. We operate three mines at the moment. They're reasonably high cost. So two in the north and one down here in, uh, in the south at Kulyanobing. Um, we use a lot of our proprietary equipment and mining services expertise to be able to unlock those small deposits. But we're currently transitioning away from those mines and uh, we're going down the path over the next two and five years to develop two main hubs, one up in the Ashburton, 30 million tonnes, and that'll put uh, iron ore, first iron ore on ship about the end of uh, next calendar year. And the Pilbara project, um, a 20 million tonne run rate up there. We've just um, done a mining agreement with um, Hancock Prospecting, and we're going to jointly develop um, Cape Carrier Berth and Southwest Creek. The Yulgarn, um, progressively down there, we're going to transition that away from uh, hematite and we're going to start producing uh, magnetite down there um, in the near future. And uh, we're going to start um, work on a pilot plant very shortly. So we're going to, in essence, the, the iron ore business, we're just simply going to move away from um, these high cost deposits. We're going to get down into low cost quartile and we'll have um, about 50,000 tonnes in that bracket within five years, 50 million tonnes and uh, we'll probably add another um, 10 or 15 of magnetite. So the Ashburton project, that's the, the focus that we've got at the moment. We've just raised a fair bit of money so that we're fully funded for development over the next couple of years. So we're going to develop Ashburton um, into a 30 million ton plus 30 year mine life, 58 and a half percent FE, um, sitting in the mine plan over the first five years. Development strategy up there, we've got a joint venture with uh, Bao Wu, POSCO and AMCI. They will jointly with us own MineCo, so the mining leases, the mining infrastructure, uh, the plant equipment from the mine gate into the port. That'll be an infrastructure company that will own the, uh, the road port, the um, loadout materials handling and the, um, the trans transshipping uh, berths. Uh, that'll be 100% owned by MinRes, and then there'll be three very large mining services contracts um, that will be running up there around the haulage, the um, port and materials handling, and the, uh, sorry, the crushing, the haulage, and the, uh, the transshipping. We'll be running probably five transshippers on the project. Pilbara Iron Ore Project, um, Marilana 5050 JV with Brockman, uh, MinRes are the manager. 20 million tonnes, 30 plus year operation, 60.5% FE grade coming out of there. Two years ahead of us for approvals, then another two years for uh, construction and commissioning. So that's about four to four and a half years away from us now. And the um, MinRes has a life for services contract up there. So we'll deliver the ore from the mine gate down to FOB, the uh, ships in Southwest Creek. Uh, and we'll do that in our joint venture that we've got with Hancock down the, uh, the uh, Roy Hill Rail and over the, um, the joint venture berth. And then finally, energy. Um, it's a big part of our journey towards um, getting to net zero. Um, it's a transitional fuel for us. So uh, getting out of diesel, getting into solar, using gas and power, wherever we can and working with uh, other green energy as it comes along. We're the largest tenement holder in the Perth Basin and the same up in the Carnarvon Basin. We had a significant discovery up there last year, uh, the Lockyer Deepwell. The test work ind indicates that it's possibly the largest onshore gas discovery in Australia. So we've got a lot of gas, low impurities, very, very clean natural gas. It's about nine Ks away from the main um, gas pipeline, Northwest um, Shelf gas pipeline. And we'll be in the very low cost quartile with that when uh, when we bring it, bring it into production. So we've got about three more production wells we're gonna drill up there um, over this year and early next year, and three more exploration wells. And we're gonna put a couple of wells down up in the, um, in the Perth Basin. So just to wrap it up, key takeaways. Um, we've been around for, just coming up to 30 years, we've grown the business, we've returned good um, shareholder returns to all of our shareholders. Um, we're gonna continue the same strategy as we have for the last three decades. 
the difference now is we've got a bigger balance sheet and uh, we've got um, good cash in the bank. The mining services business, it's going to double over the next three or so years. We're going to be a top four lithium producer globally um, within the next four get our hydroxide plants up and running. Um, spot price has gone from $400 to $5,000 a tonne on the spot market. Um, hydroxide, um, we expect, as I said, to uh, have all our downstreaming done within about the next four years. Um, and the hydroxide price seems to be um, in a good place. Um, no doubt it's not going to stay there forever. Um, and the iron ore we're transitioning within the next five years will have um, probably in excess of 60 million tonnes of um, um, reasonable quality, but um, low cost um, iron ore. And the, uh, the gas, the energy side of our business gives us um, an awful lot of options for the future. So uh, that sort of winds up where the business is at. So if there's any questions out there, more than happy to take them. Thanks, Chris. Uh, great presentation. Just, uh, I guess the first question on, on Marble and the discussions with Albert Marble, I mean, they were pretty, cl you know, clear last year that not selling spodumene was sort of the plan and they didn't want to go down that path. I mean, what, was it just the economics and the, and the spot price that became so attractive that, that sort of changed the view on selling spot out of Wajna? Yeah, purely, purely economics. I mean, um, we think that, uh, no doubt, on, on these sort of prices that um, we're going to bank a lot of cash um, going forward. So we're going to turn um, all the mines into uh, full production and uh, we're simply then going to uh, either buy or build uh, hydroxide plants to be able to take that capacity. But yeah, in the meantime, um, we're going to bank as much cash as we can. So there's no limit on how much spodumene you'll sell. It'll just be if the, if the hydroxide plants take a bit longer, you just sell more spot in the meantime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to get this, the hydroxide plants acquired and built as quick as we can, but they are going to take time. But it, um, it'll go straight into the spod market. Any surplus spod, we'll just um, sell it. And, and Albert Miles previously disclosed, you know, they're building two 50,000 tonne plants in China, plus they bought another 30,000 tonne one last year. I mean, are they the likely destination points for, for Wadjana, or is there different plants beyond that? Yeah, look, we're, we're going to feed... Kemerton's going to be fed from um, green bushes. Um, but the Wajana, yes, yeah, certainly it's probably going to head in that direction. I mean, there is, look, uh, from the MinRes side, um, we've been having some really good discussion with Albemarle on uh, building more capacity here in Australia and um, from MinRes and, and now from Albemarle, we're very keen to explore the possibility of putting a, a 50,000 tonne plant up in the north. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. We've got a, we've got a great site up there and we've got the capacity to put a plant there and I, I think through uh, the MinRes construction capability, I think we can get one done up there for a, a number that'll work for the JV. Chemist and those obviously cost them a lot more than they'd anticipated. I mean, where, where's that at with the ramp up? I and mean, we're seeing issues with the Quinana plant with, with IGO in terms of product quality. Are, are they at that stage now where they're starting to produce hydroxide or is that still a few months off? Yeah, they're just... We've been hit pretty hard with um, the construction down there simply because um, we were getting parts made all around the world and the supply chain, the shipping, all of those, those issues that everyone sort of faced um, and it's blown the cost out as well. But uh, look, they're, uh, they're putting feed into train one now and the good thing with uh, what Albemarle built down there, it's pretty much a carbon copy of what they're running up in China and they've also bought... Um, some of their people up in China down to help with the commissioning. So, you know, we're not expecting to have too many issues around that. How do you think about the economics of that, given you're now having to pay, you know, the, I think the original thought process was there may be a swap deal or something on tonnes, but you're now having to pay spot spodumene prices out of green bushes into there. I mean, it does erode the margin a bit. Well, it does two things. I mean, it, it gives us an offtake out of green bushes and it's, it's close by down there. Um, but... Yeah, look, at, uh, at the same time, we can offset that fairly simply. We've got um, tons coming out of Mount Marion. Um, and look, at the end of the day, um, it, it doesn't matter for us in the future, the, uh, the spot price on the, uh, on the spot, we're more interested in the hydroxide. 
So you're on Mount Marion. I mean, you've got that, that short-term deal with Gan Feng. Is it likely to turn into an extension of that or is there some option, opportunity here to use that Mount Marion tonnes to offset what you're consuming at Greenbushes back into Albemarle or something like that? Um, a work in progress on, on where we're heading with that. But look, there is a good opportunity there with um, Gangfang have got the capacity to extend that, um, that arrangement we got with them. But we got that in place. I mean, at the moment, we're basically um, completely changing our, um, our lithium business internally and, and with our JV partners. So we've sort of had a lot of balls in the air lately. So um, I just kicked that out down to the end of August so that we can get some breathing time and um, we'll figure out what to do with that over the next sort of 30 to 60 days. But, but w whatever we do, we'll keep toll treating that and um, our relationship with Gangpeng is uh, very strong. And on the, the gas discovery at Lockyer, I mean, it's, as you say, it was probably the biggest thing that we've seen. I mean, how much gas do you think you could get producing out of there? I mean, obviously more than you'd consume yourself. So it's going to become its own revenue and profit centre, I, I presume. Yeah, I mean, in our style, I mean, we like to be able to get um, these projects into production reasonably quickly so we can start getting um, some cash flow out of them and they pay for themselves. So, I mean, we're looking at how best to develop that now. It's probably, look, there's, we've got some work to do on approvals and, and the like, but um, it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal to get that done. But certainly enough gas there to supply us for a long, long time. So it's another cost we'll be able to control. Um, and there's opportunity out there where we can um, go and do downstreaming. I mean, I'd like to think when we get the magnetite going that um, eventually we'll be able to pelletise it and that gives us a much cleaner, greener um, feed source that, you know, would be um, available worldwide. And that Lockyer discovery, is that where you're starting to think about hydroxide plants in Australia again, that you've got that cheap energy source as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and look, the good thing with, uh, with the location of that discovery is that we can put um, downstream plants, we can put it pretty much anywhere on the west coast and in, um, in Geraldton or Port Hedland, um, we can move the gas um, in any direction we want. In fact, it's cheaper to move it north than it is to pump it south. And then on, on the Ashburton project, I mean, you sort of fleshed out a little bit that you know, the mine capex is going to be shared amongst the various owners of, of, of the Red Hill JV, I guess, but then the capital cost of that whole project, I mean, how comfortable are you with it? I mean, there's a lot of inflationary pressures in WA at the moment? No, look, we're really comfortable with that. I mean, we've been building, uh, we've done a couple of hundred k's of um, off-highway haul road over the last two or three years. I mean, we've got over 600 good guys in-house on construction. So there's no real risk on that. It's it's flat. The uh, There's no science in building the road. We're going to put um, um, a CSI crushing plant up there. It'll be capable of doing about 35 million tonne. We've sized everything up there. It's got a nameplate of 30, but we've sized all the equipment to do 35. So no, nothing technically challenging up there. The, even the dredging, we're running trans shippers. Um, so the dredging is a million dollar exercise. So, you know, just no, no um, it, it's a low risk project. And what's the ultimate potential there? I mean, if you're just using trans shippers, I presume, 30 million tonnes isn't the limit. You can push it well beyond that. Yeah, look, I, I think um, we've done some work around 55 to 60 and we can get out there fairly easily. Um, but I, I think probably beyond that, you know, it, you might get out to about 75. Um, but but there's, look, there's certainly a lot of ore in that, that part of the world. It's sort of where there's been a bunch of stranded tonnes for a long, long time and it's sort of um, it's giving us the um, supply chain now to unlock them. And the, the Port Hedland Southwest Creek project with Marilana, is that the two year approvals process? Seems pretty long to me, but I guess it then ties in nicely that Ashburton pays for the capex. I mean, is that the sort of deliberate strategy with that? Yeah, no, I mean, it really is about two years of uh, approvals. We're going to get approvals down around the, um, the harbour. Um, we've got to do uh, a haul road from uh, Marilana down to the railhead. Um, there is, there's a lot of work to be done on those approvals and you know, approvals nowadays are moving much slower than they were two and three years ago. So I, I think, yeah, being realistic, it, it's about four and a half years before we see first ore coming out of there. 
And just on, on the structure, Chris, I mean, it's something I think you mentioned briefly at the AGM last year, but a potential spin out of the lithium business. I mean, it's almost as big as Pilbara, arguably, and you've got pretty similar market caps. <laughs> yes, we have indeed, haven't we? Um, <laughs> I did mention last year, I think I did mention that um, I wasn't um, up while I'm sitting in the seat for giving up control of the lithium business. So um, it was just, I think it was an option. I think we were getting hammered on how we expect to fund um, all the development we're doing. And I did say, I mean, we've got a lot of levers we can pull. We've got uh, an iron ore business and a lithium business, um, but uh, I don't, I, let me put it like this, I won't be losing control of the lithium business in the next five years, but um, we have got good, good um, levers in, in those areas where we can raise some um, some money, but I mean, at the moment, I think we're sitting with about two and a quarter billion cash in the bank. So between that and where we're heading um, on the cash, we think we're going to bank out of the business over the next couple of years. I think we're well funded, but I mean, look, we never turned down a good opportunity either. And just a bit sort of shorter term, Chris. I mean, we've seen some pretty decent cost upgrades for the bigger iron ore miners in the Pilbara. I mean, how are you seeing things? Is it still getting worse or are we starting to settle down from the, the cost increases? No, I think it's settling a bit. I mean, you know, the, the universal problem, I mean, it's not just Australia worldwide, it's a labour shortage. And um, we're probably looking at any given time for, you know, 500 plus people. Um, goods, you know, there, there's some pressure on, uh, on goods. Caterpillar parts went up about 15.5%. Um, and that wasn't that long ago whether we, we already copped an increase. Getting stuff made overseas or, or in Australia is challenging. Um, and shipping is, is incredibly challenging if you want to make something or you want to get a ball mill in from overseas. I mean, it takes a long time. So, yeah, we've we've just got to be a little bit careful with our expectations on time now um, because if you're pressing time too hard, that's when the cost will blow out. So if we look forward to the next couple of years then, you've got Ashburton, potentially a hydroxide plant, oil and gas project. Does it start to limit what you want to do in terms of third-party mining services projects? Not at all, no. That's uh, our mining services is um, um, the passion in the business. I mean, that kind of keeps us agile. I mean, we, we chase down every crushing contract that's out there. Um, and big or small, we want to continue to win them. So we're doing that. We're doing, we're doing a, a reasonable amount of um, mining, drill and blast and mining for um, some of our tier one clients and um, developing the joint ventures. One of the skill sets that we bring to the table, like this Ashburton project, is that we can come along and we can put a, a 35 million tonne plant on site. Um, no capital for our JV partners. We'll do all the haulage. We're gonna, we've designed the trans shippers. We're gonna operate them as a mining services business. So we bring that skill set, but we're also moving those tonnes at a number that um, the mining services industry can't do. I mean, we've got a unique crushing plant. The, um, these big road trains that we've developed in conjunction with Kenworth, we're um, down at a pretty low number on those, about similar cost per tonne kilometre as um, a, a medium haulage um, rail system. And in fact, we'll move, we'll move our Ashburton tonnes per 100 kilometres um, cheaper than we can move the uh, the Yulgan tons down to um, Esperance. So, yeah, we bring a lot to the table with our mining services, but, I mean, that part of the business, as I said earlier, I mean, that's going to more than double over the next three, uh, three or so years, um, and that's from stuff we've got locked in, um, and there's a lot of other work out there that we're sort of chasing down. Okay, just on the Yulgan, Chris, I mean, the, the tons there are, I guess, slightly lower than what you originally sort of put out to the market? You obviously didn't pay anything for the asset, but what has been the, the limiting issue there on, on getting those tonnes out? It's just a cost thing. I mean, we're spread out down there over 150 k's from south to north on the pits. So it takes our, uh, our GM down there about two days to get around the site. So it's just the, the distant pits that we're running. Uh, we've got um, huge reserves down there in terms of uh, magnetite. And we see that as, as it's a good opportunity going forward because it'll give us 30 or 40 year life down there. Um, and it's going to give us a much higher quality product. And if we can turn that into pallet, um, 
we'll be doing okay. I mean, when we first started down there, I think we said we we're going to do about 6 million tonne for about five years. And then we sort of decided that we'd do 10 million tonnes. So, you know, of course, that kind of shortens the life a bit too. So the magnetite project would be down at Yulgarn or would it be in Quinana? Where, where would you think you'd put it? I would put the plant down in the Yulgarn. Uh, and there's opportunity down there. For, so for the pallet plant, good question. I mean, it just, it just depends on where we can get that energy. It's a big consumer of energy, so we need to be able to get gas to it. So possibly, yeah, we'd probably do that somewhere like Quinana. Yeah, okay. And just on, on the other iron ore assets at, at Iron Valley, I mean, it's, it's, got, it's still got a big reserve, but obviously a, a big pit cut back at some point. I mean, does that eventually fold into the Marilana sort of project? And if you can get the transport cost down, then, then that sort of project looks like a, something you could add tonnes to longer term? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's always, it's had nine lives, Iron Valley. I mean, it's a long way out. Um, and, and it's high cost, but it keeps surviving. So, I mean, if we got to a point where it wasn't making money, we'd turn it off. But, you know, as long as it makes money, I mean, we'll just keep it ticking. I mean, it's, it's been a good operation for a long time, but you know, down the track, I, I don't think that that'll end up going on rail. I mean, I think we've got better tons to put on rail. Okay. And you've just done the big debt deal, obviously, so we know where the, the debt financing's coming from now. I mean, in terms of dividends, how are you thinking about that through this sort of big capex phase you're about to go through? I think, look, we've only not paid a dividend once and we're probably, we're probably going to keep paying dividends. We've got a number of shareholders out there that, um, that like getting a dividend, so we're probably going to return back to our, our normal policy. Um, but we didn't do it... Um, last year, for, you know, for obvious, I mean, iron ore just tanked and it just was not a good look to be um, out there paying out uh, um, dividends when we didn't know where the end was. I mean, we wanted to make sure that we had the business under control and want to make sure that we knew where we were at with the balance sheet and how we were going to fund the projects. There's a lot more value for our shareholders in building out these projects, not just the iron ore, but, you know, the... Um, uh, the way that we've restructured the um, the lithium business now, we're going to be investing in um, an offshore hydroxide plant. So um, good payback on, on all of those. So that's probably where dividend disappears if we're under threat. And that move offshore, I mean, it's a bit of the first time you've really put capital offshore. I mean, how comfortable are you with that? I mean, obviously, Albemarle know what they're doing in China, for example. I mean, how do you think about it? Yeah, Albemarle are comfortable with it. I mean, they've got a big operation up there. They know what they're doing. Um, our, our success has always been here in Western Australia. And um, I think going forward, um, as mineral resources, I mean, we really want to put more hydroxide into WA because this is where we live and where our kids are. Um, it may cost a little bit more in capital to build here, but I think one thing we've all sort of figured out over the last few years is that um, surety of supply is probably a lot more important than um, a one-off capital cost. So, I mean, I'm thinking about the longer term and I'm thinking if you're selling Australian product to the world, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the best brands. I mean, Western Australia, I would think, is probably the best mining region in the world. And, I mean, we really deserve to have a... try and keep those jobs on shore here. So uh, I'm confident we're going to come up with a number that... Um, where we can build at least another 50,000 tonnes. And if I can do 50, we could probably get that out further. OK, terrific. Well, Chris, thanks very much for taking the time out. Plenty going on in the men's business, clearly. So uh, thanks for presenting today. Yeah, no, look, pleasure. And um, I hope, uh, hope it was useful. But um, sorry I couldn't get across there. But, you know, we are, we are busy. And um, I don't want to step out of Perth and find that Mark's going to close the borders again. So... <laughs> we like to stay home and keep the business running. So, yeah, look, thanks for the here. Uh, Great. Thanks Thank for having Thanks, us. Chris. Take care. Bye.